Hi, this is Dan Heisman, and we're continuing with our series of YouTube videos to help you improve your chess game. Apparently we have some new people in thanks to the Netflix show The Queen's Gambit, so welcome. Um, I have two books in front of me right now. One is called The Development of Chess Style by Max Ua, and the other is The Battle of Chess Ideas by Tony Sadie. And the idea of both books is to kind of take you through time and bring you up as to what developed over time. And I thought I would do the same kind of thing in a very <laughs> brief manner uh, with regard to opening theory. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna kind of get in a time capsule and go from the earliest kind of openings up to modern day. And of course, I can't do complete justice to this in a you know 26 minute video or something. So you have to excuse me a little bit if I jump around or skip a few things. All right, so in the old days, you know, it was manly to start with E4 and... So in these double, in these E4 openings, black usually defended with E5. Not always, but usually. I mean, for instance, in the Sicilian, if we look at the Lowenthal variation, Knight c6, d4 c takes, knight takes e5. You know, Lowenthal was a 19th century player, so, you know, this was being played way back then. But that was unusual. Most games were manly and e4, e5, and then you would fight it out. If someone sacrificed something, you would take it and try to defend. So, you know, very common was to play a king's gambit. You know, f4, pawn takes, you know, you see Morphe doing this, knight f3, and so on. Uh, you also even saw some, like, four knights games, you know, were not popular much past the middle 19th century. But, you know, you get four knights games where white plays bishop to b5, or knight to d5, or, you know, something like that. Um, so that's the kind of way things were being played at the very start, e4, e5. Um, you know, as the 19th century went on, there was, you know, always experimentations. Uh, the King's Gambit sort of lost a lot of its appeal at the end of the 19th century. And we saw a lot of the, you know, Joko Piano stuff being developed. Bishop C4, Bishop C5, C3, Knight F6, D4, E takes, C takes, Bishop checks, where White can play Bishop D2 or Knight C3. Uh, you know, two Knights defense with knight f3, knight c6, bishop c4, knight f6, knight g5, d5, e takes, and of course knight takes is a famous mistake. White can play the fried liver attack or the lolly. Knight a5, bishop checks, pawn up, pawn takes, pawn takes, bishop e2, h6, knight f3 being the main move, but Steinitz in the late 19th century played knight h3, which uh, 70 years later, Bobby Fischer resurrected for the uh, U.S. championship. So we were seeing more of, you know, these kind of things. The Roy Lopez was starting to be developed to a better extent. Bishop to b5. a6 is called Morphe's move, so it even went back that far. Bishop a4, knight f6, you know, castles. And people were experimenting with various lines in the French. You know, we have the Rubenstein variation with pawn takes, knight takes. Rubenstein was the second best player in the world behind Lasker around the turn of the century. So we have that. Uh, the Winnower variation at, with bishop b4 didn't become popular too much later, but Winnower himself was an earlier player. A lot of these things were named after the early players who ventured with them and tried these interesting ideas to uh, in their games. And, and when they tried them, if they tried them multiple times, then sometimes the opening got named after them. Okay, so we get it into the turn of the century, and then all of a sudden d4 started to become popular. And people started playing d4, and mostly again we got symmetric openings with d5 after c4. Of course, the big three are the Queen's Gambit decline, which was the most popular then, the Slav, and the Queen's Gambit accepted. And we started to see the evolution of theory with, e, with d4, d5 openings. You know, if you go up into the 1910s, 1920s, we see a lot of games 
starting this way, knight f3, c6. And this is where they started to figure out that maybe the most accurate move here wasn't bishop d3. Maybe white should play queen c2 first or rook c1 and try to entice black into taking that pawn when the bishop's still on f1, sort of a game of chicken here. And you see an awful lot of games being played by Eliakin and Capablanca where they're experimenting with this kind of opening just for the fun of it. Let's ask Stockfish 12. I'll move the board up. What move would, would Stockfish 12 play in this position um, without all that knowledge of theory? And I have no database, no opening database in my Stockfish 12. So you can see that it took them, you know, years and years and years to figure out that Bishop D3 was not the most accurate. And here we are with an engine that plays almost 3600 level. And Stockfish 12 is saying, no, you don't have to do all those subtle finesses. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, you could just play Bishop D3 right away. Oh, he just dropped it down to point 18. Let's see if that means anything. Point 18. Ah, oh, no. Wow, he just went to C takes D5 and then play Bishop D3. So he, so he avoids black taking the pawn. Interesting. Well, we don't want to spend the video watching uh, Stockfish 12 figure out how to play the Queen's Gambit, but you get, you get the idea. All right, let's turn that off, and we'll make the window back to normal video size. All right, so we see a lot of these Queen's Gambit games being played. Now, probably the two biggest things that happened to openings were the hypermodern revolution and then kind of the Soviet uh, infusion after World War II. And the hypermodern revolution, uh, what the hypermoderns said, and the hypermoderns were Richard Reddy, Julius Breyer, and uh, Aaron Nimzovich. Those were the, the big three. And what they said was, you don't need to occupy the center. You know, you don't have to put your pieces in the center. What you need your pieces to do is control the center. And the best example they gave of that was Let's say you, you're trying to figure out where to put your king bishop. Well, yes, you could play e4 and then develop the bishop toward the middle of the board like this. But they said, you really don't need to be in the middle of the board. What you could do is fianchetto your bishop. Fianchetto means move a knight pawn up one, put the bishop behind it. If you fianchetto your bishop, your bishop is going right through the center and controlling the center. And when it does that, it's, it's very strong, and it's also well shielded and protected, and this is a really good way to develop your pieces. <clears throat> this isn't the only thing the hypermodern said. They also said you could let the other person set up a big center, for instance, like in a King's Indian, c4, g6, knight c3, bishop, like this, which would be unthinkable to the classic players. And then later on, you play break moves like c5 or e5, let's say d6 first, and then later an e5 or c5, and force him to do things to poke holes in that center, and then you'd be okay. So the hypermoderns said a lot of things that affected opening theory. And the entire set, for instance, of Indian defenses came into play. So now when white plays d4, instead of black playing d5, he plays knight f6. Knight f6 is a different way of stopping e4 without committing your pawn to the d5 square. And some of the more popular Indian defenses would be like c4, e6, knight c3, bishop to b4 is the Nimzo Indian, named after the hypermodern Nimzovich. So they call it the Nimzo Indian. Uh, if you bring it out, the knight to f3 first and he plays b6, this is a queen's Indian. Uh, if black plays c5 d5 we have a benoni which doesn't have the word indian in it but it is a type of indian uh we also have as we said the king's indian with knight c3 bishop g7 then we have the grunfeld named after ernst grunfeld again a player right at that hypermodern time who started figuring out well you could do this and if he takes and you take with a knight and he plays e4 you're, you'll be able to play Knight takes c3, and then hammer away at the center here. Let's say white plays the older line, bishop c4, castle, 
Knight e2, c5, hitting, hitting at the center multiple times. Knight to c6, trying to get white to do something with the center so that you can counterattack here. So the Grunfeld, this is the main line of the exchange Grunfeld. The Grunfeld is another Indian defense. Again, you could call it the Grunfeld Indian, usually they just call it the Grunfeld. So all these Indian defenses came up around the time of the hypermoderns just about a hundred years ago, right around the start of World War II. And in fact, I think Breyer was either killed in World War II or became like injured in World War II and then, then died soon after. But um, Breyer, Nimsevich, and Richard Reddy. Uh, Richard Reddy, they named the Reddy opening after Richard Reddy. That's where you play Knight F. A lot of people call Knight F3 the Reddy opening, but the Knight F3 actually can transpose into a lot of things. The pure ready opening is where black plays d5, and then white hits with the side pawn c4. So that's the ready. The idea, again, being to take that classical move d5 and hit it with a hypermodern attack from the side. And therefore, we get also with white can play c4 himself and just go after attacking the pawn, attacking the center from the side. So that's the English opening. Similar things were happening with e4 then. People said, well, I guess black doesn't really have to play e5. Well, the French had been played for a long time like that. But after World War II, uh, after World War I, and certainly after World War II, the Sicilians started to become more popular. Just like the English, you take a side pawn, a c-pawn, and you attack a central square. And that way later, when white tries to move out his central pawns, you can trade a side pawn for a center pawn and you'll end up with two center pawns and he only has one. In his book on his best games, I think Larson kind of tongue in cheek called the uh, open variation of the Sicilian for white a cheap trap. <laughs> um, so e4, c5, Sicilian and many, 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 many lines in the Sicilian. We could spend, you know, a multiple videos just going over what are all the main lines in the Sicilian. But the Sicilians started to become more popular after, after World War I, and certainly much more popular after World War II. In fact, we'll, we'll get up to that in a minute. Okay, so what else is happening between World War I and World War II? Well, al Yekin occasionally played knight f6 against e4, so e5, knight d5, d4, d6. Again, enticing white's pawns forward so you could attack them. So this became known as al Yekin's defense to e4. Um, let's see, Karo can, e4, c6, d4, d5, another sem, all these lines where black doesn't play e5 were sort of dubbed together as the semi-open defenses to e4. So if you buy a book on semi-open defenses, it doesn't really mean that the board is semi-open. A semi-open position is one where both sides have a semi-open file, which is the main idea in the Open King's Indian. Here, white has a semi-open D file, and black has a semi-open C file. So this is literally a semi-open opening. But what they did is they just lumped all the non-E4, E5 pawn moves together as semi-open defenses. So if you bought a book like Ludic Pachman's Semi-Open Defenses, it was all about the Sicilian, the Carocan, the French, the Peards, the, Ma the uh, Aljakins. You know, those were called semi-open defenses. So they were pretty much developed, you know, at least started for the most part between World War I and World War II. Okay, so as I said, the, after World War II, the Soviets made tremendous contributions to opening theory. And, you know, it was said that Bavidic was the first one to kind of start to scientifically, you know, study and play openings. Bavidic did play that winnower variation we showed you earlier, e6, d4, d5, knight c3, bishop to b4. That was, certainly wasn't his only defense, but he did play uh, winnower among other things. Uh, the, the Soviets with uh, Geller and Bronstein and Korchnoi and others really worked very hard on the King's Indian main lines. So we see the main line Tabia King's Indian today, Bishop E2, Castle, Knight F3, E5, Castle, 
knight c6, d5, knight e7. There's the main line, Tabiak King's Indian. Really was worked on a lot uh, right after World War II. Uh, today, I think the computers like knight e1, knight d7, bishop e3, f5, f3, f4, bishop f2 is maybe white's most promising line against that. All right, so the King's Indian was popular. The Sicil open Sicilians became very popular. And there was a Polish grandmaster who was playing in Argentina when World War II broke out. His name was Miguel Nadorf. And when World War II broke out, he asked for asylum in Argentina, and they granted it. And he represented Argentina the rest of his life. And Nadorf noticed that in a lot of these lines in the Sicilian, you know, black would like to play e5, but he has to watch out for ideas like bishop b5 check or knight to b5. So what Nadorf suggested was before you play e5 and drive the knight away, make sure he can't go to b5 and the bishop can't go to b5. Play the strange looking move a6 first. And he started playing that line and the most popular line against it was bishop to g5. And this became a really big rage of grandmaster play. And a lot of extremely complicated games were developed with this. <clears throat> and after World War II, young Bobby Fischer took up the Nadorf as his main defense against e4. And he really popularized it tremendously. And, you know, not that it wasn't popular before, but it became the main weapon to defend against e4 is to play the and even today the Nadorf is still the most popular of all the uh, lines in the Sicilian. Fisher when he played white against the Nadorf would play bishop to c4 and uh, that today is not considered the best move but Fisher was developing the bishop c4 lines. So <clears throat> the Nadorf became a popular line in the open. There were other lines that became popular uh, for instance in the 60s, the British started writing a lot of articles about the dragon, so-called dragon variation here because it looks like a little dragon. <clears throat> and the main line here for white is to play bishop to e3, bishop g7, and now f3, which was called the Yugoslav attack, where white castles queenside, throws his kingside pawns at the black king. Those kind of lines were developed a lot in the 1960s. And a lot of the semi-open openings, the Karo Can became very popular. Uh, world champion Petrosian played the Karo Can a lot. So that was being worked on. Uh, the Bobby Fischer took up the King's Indian and the Grunfeld. So they were extremely popular in the uh, 50s and 60s. And, you know, the Grunfeld remains popular today. The King's Indian a little bit less so. All right, so there was a player in the 1960s and he played a lot of weird openings, and his name was Duncan Suttles. And Duncan Suttles was a grandmaster from Canada. And if you played e4, he would play a move like g6, the modern defense, and people would laugh at him and say that he was playing all these inferior defenses. And Duncan Suttles liked to avoid kind of book openings. In that sense, he was a little bit like Magnus Carlsen, who tries to just get an equality out of the opening and outplay you from there. But Duncan Suttles would play all these weird openings, and he was criticized as being like a little crazy. But actually, he was just kind of a little bit ahead of his time. And what happened with openings in the 1960s was Petrosian was world champion, and Petrosian was famous for not liking to lose, and he liked to just put his pieces on good, solid squares and not make a lot of weaknesses. And I don't want to get into, like, style. That's what uh, Max Uwe's book and Tony Sadie's book is more about. But, but people thought that playing correctly under Petrosian was the right way to play, and you didn't make weaknesses, and you, know, you didn't push crazy pawn pushes because that, that was imbalances that, that hurt your game. So people like, Tony, like uh, Duncan Suttles were considered you know, aberrations. And even when Spassky became world champion and Fisher became world champion, that didn't change much. And when Karpov became world champion, Karpov was kind of like a super Petrosian. He played a little bit with Petrosian style, but because he was young and energetic and he could really outsit people a lot like Magnus Carlsen does today, he would play these really long games 
But unlike Petrosian, who was happy to get a lot of draws against the top grandmasters, Karpov played for wins against the other top grandmasters, and he got a lot of them. So in that sense, Karpov was a greater world champion than Petrosian. And still, this Petrosian style, though, perme permeated the uh, chess world, where people thought that, uh, you know, if you play with a way that, that is very solid and, and not creating weaknesses, that was the right thing to do. And then along came Garry Kasparov. And Garry Kasparov said, no, I want to win. I'm willing to take weaknesses if I can put pressure on my opponent. And he started playing moves like, you know, G4 in the middle of a Sicilian to attack. And Karpov put a lot of the dynamism back into the game. And he said, it's okay to be imbalanced. It's okay to play sharply. And along after Karpov, uh, sorry, after Kasparov came Alexei Shirov, who was a fan of Michael Tal. Now, Michael Tal liked to play the Benoni. We talked about the Benoni earlier. D he played what's called the modern Benoni. So after c5, d5, e6, knight c3, pawn takes, pawn takes, d6, e4. So Tal would play the black side of the Benoni here. And Tal really didn't, you know, he played a lot of obviously theoretical famous openings, but he didn't get any like openings named after him. And Shirov, who was also in that, from that area in Latvia, you know, he, Tal was his hero. And Shirov took what Kasparov did and took it even further and became, played even more imbalanced than, than Kasparov did. And Shirov wasn't obviously the player that Kasparov did, and he has a terrible record when he played Kasparov. But they played more um, imbalanced chess. So we see more openings that were getting more imbalanced that way. Uh, it, it wasn't that they invented new openings, it was just a new way of playing the older openings. And, and openings continued to develop. For instance, in the 2000 World Championship match, instead of playing Morphy's move, A6, Vladimir Kramnik against Kasparov played Knight F6 to Berlin. And Kasparov played the line that was the main line against it at that time, which is to allow what's called the Berlin Wall. Castle, knight takes e4, d4, knight d6, bishop takes c6, d takes c6, d takes e5, knight f5, queen takes d8, check, king takes d8. Berlin Wall. So black has the bishop pair, but white has a four on three majority on the king side for the end game, and black can't castle. So Kasparov stubbornly kept playing this line for white against Kramnik, and Kramnik was very comfortable with this position with black. And even though Kasparov was well known for being good with the queens on the board and, and with more complicated attacking positions, Kasparov felt that, you know, he could prove that he could also win with this kind of position. And he kept playing it every game against Kramnik, and it turned out that in the World Championship match, Kramnik did not lose any games with black in the entire match, and he won the World Championship. So that was done. Another thing that Kramnik did with when he was playing Kasparov was when Kramnik was white and they played a King's Indian, Kramnik would play what's called the bayonet attack. So after d6, bishop e2, castle, knight f3, e5, castle, knight c6, d5, knight e7, white would play b4. And Kasparov was having a tough time equalizing and about 20 years ago, he gave up the King's Indian. And a lot of the people in the world go in, oh, the King's Indian is refuted. And if Kasparov's not going to play it, then we're not going to play it either. And a lot of people became down on the King's Indian. Okay, the last word in openings is computer's effect on the openings. The computers have found that like in a lot of these lines in the open Sicilian, knight f3, d6, d4, c takes, knight takes, normally white gets an advantage of about, you know, 0.15 or 0.2 pawns in the opening, any more than that, and black gets a little wary. Well, in a lot of these lines that people have been playing for the last 50, 60 years, the computers started to come up with ideas for white that kept white having an advantage of more like half a pawn, and grandmasters didn't like that, and they also didn't want to play complicated openings where their opponent could analyze them with the computer and come up with moves that, that are, were complicated that could have, they could have to solve those, those ideas over the board.
So when this started, when computers started getting really good and finding these things out in the around the year 2010 or so, the Grandmasters started changing their openings and the Sicilian, which had been dominant for well over half a century as the main defense against E4, still was popular and people would play it when they needed to win with black. But in just normal games against the other top Grandmasters, all of a sudden you started to see black playing E5 against E4 because the computer said, well, that's the lines where you get the least advantage. Uh, we also saw cr another Kramnik idea was to play Petrov's defense and just go for equal positions. And for a period of about 20 years from the 1990s to the mid 20 teens, the Petrov's defense was an extremely popular defense in top grandmaster play. Again, I, I apologize for not being able to go through every single possible opening in a, in a less than 30 minute video. But yes, knight, knight f3, knight f6 became very popular. Knight takes d6, knight f3, knight takes d4, d5. Petrov's in black was doing quite nicely getting fairly equal positions and getting getting the grandmasters the draw that they wanted with black. Well, with computers, now we see grandmasters going back to something from 140 years ago. They start playing bishop c4 again. And now they still don't quite trust knight f6, so they play bishop c5, but now they realize that the c3, d4 lines that were played 140 years ago are only good for equality. So what they do is they play Gioco Pianissimo with like d3 or castle. And then they play it like a delayed Roy Lopez, like c3, with the idea of later on they can play d4 or b4 and they can stick the bishop still back on c2 like is done in the main line Roy Lopez, but without black playing a6 and b5 and without all the book of the Roy Lopez, which was so much developed over the last century. So now we're seeing these very symmetric kind of double e-pawn openings where the computer says to both players, okay, white, yes, you've got your advantage of 0.13 or whatever it is. And yes, black, you're not in danger of white finding some complicated line where he's going to blow you off the board and you've got your almost equality at your minus 0.13 or well, point plus of 0.13 for, for white. And yes, you can play that way. And that way, um, you know, black's okay against e4. How about d4? Well, over the years after d4, d5, for people who were wanted to avoid opening theory and just get out of the opening and get an equal game with white, the London variation went from being a, a rare, rare, rare sideline to something that Magnus Carlsen even plays once in a while and a lot of amateurs play just to avoid all the theory and, and, and avoid complicated openings. So they just play bishop f4 and knight f3 and e3 and castle kingside. Uh, when the queen's gambit is played for the last... 30 or years or so, the Slav defense has become the most popular defense for black. Gary Kasparov, when he gave up the King's Indians, started playing Slav. And it's not the old Slav, which is knight c3, pawn takes a4, bishop f5. That's the old Slav that was played. But rather the semi-Slav, where black plays e6, sorry, after knight c3 plays e6, and now white can play it solid with e3 or go into the wild crazy lines that uh, Alexei Shirov would play, which is actually named after Bodvinik, the Bodvinik variation with pawn takes and e4. And then black holds his pawn and white plays e5 and black plays h6. And we get, you know, bishop h4, g5, knight takes, pawn takes, bishop takes with crazy imbalanced play. Uh, Shirov did this a lot. Uh, Kasparov had a lot of games with this line, the Bodvinik variation. So these were the kind of imbalanced things that became imp became popular. A little bit less so now that the computers have their say in these openings. All right, so that's kind of it. From uh, soup to nuts, we've got from the early 19th century up till today. I know I missed a few things. I apologize, but that's about what we could do in the time for the video. Hopefully this was educational for you and you enjoyed it. If you did, tell your friends about my channel and you could subscribe. See you next time. Bye.